Is it just me or am I excited that my barbershop is going to be opening up really soon? All right, look, I am not the only one. I know you got to be excited, right? I, it's been a while. I've, it's been hanging in there for a little bit, but I can't wait to get, you know, to get a uh, you know fade and get that haircut again. I need it in my life. And ladies, I know you're excited, you know, that your salon and all those people are going to open up because yo, some of y'all roots are showing. All right, some of y'all tried to do a little at home situation and maybe it didn't come out the way you were hoping. All right, it's okay. It's okay. All right. There's some fellas who's giving themselves some messed up haircuts too. So it is what it is. Look, and by the way, since it's Mother's Day, if you still don't know what to get mom, pay to get that fixed. All right. Pay for her next salon appointment. I'm pretty sure she'd appreciate it. But anyways, we've been in this series, Is It Just Me, for four weeks now. And the whole point of it was because of the this. I mean, the whole purpose of this series was to focus on the idea of isolation because we've all been social distancing now for probably 50 something days, right? That so many things have been shut down, so many things closed, and we've probably spent more alone time than any of us would like to admit. And my biggest fear was that even though social distancing could keep us from getting sick physically, my biggest fear and burden was that social distancing could lead for many people to get sick emotionally and mentally because that's what happens when we get stuck in a place of isolation. I mean, you can still be surrounded by people and still feel alone, right? I know I'm not the only one. So the point of this series, Is It Just Me?, was to let you know, look, it's not just you. There's other people who are going through it and, and you are not alone. Now, I've been asking this question, is it just me, in a unique way every single week for the past four weeks. I encourage you to just catch the replays on YouTube or on our website at tabernacleofgod.church. But I'm going to ask it one last time, two different ways. You ready? Is it just me, or does God seem far sometimes? Or is it just me, does God seem unfair sometimes? Look, I'm, I know I'm not the only one who's ever felt that or thought that. Right? It's not fun to kind of be left in the dark with questions and not enough answers. Right? It's not fun there. And, but there is something amazing. All right, Though God does not love it. God does not love and his heart breaks when we fall into pits of isolation, of, of depression, of anxiety, of, of so many of these things. He doesn't purposely lead us into those things. He doesn't want us to be in those things. But... God is so good that he can take those bad moments in our lives and turn it around to make a difference and to do something in our lives. So even though you might not have an, and I might not answer that question the way you want me to answer the question today. Hey, is God fair, right? Is he far? I'm going to answer it, but in a different way. And I might leave you in the dark by the end of this. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Not everybody has all the answers, all right? I don't have all the answers. No one does. But there is something that happens, though, that God can use when he leverages the dark, all right? Now, there's when I say dark, be careful, all right? Because there's sometimes you and I fall into isolation because we walk in the dark. You know, Paul would say in his word, listen, walk in the light. Walk in the light of God. Don't walk in darkness. Don't walk in wicked ways. Because if we walk in the ways that are anti-God, we will end up in the dark. And that wasn't God's fault. That was our choice. You know, sometimes, yes, God feels far. But I've heard pastors say, uh, if God feels far, he's not the one who moved. It tends to be us. But there is something amazing that if we're left in the dark, God does something. All right, check this out. The University of Maryland actually did this cool study that it, it was talking about people who has like who have a lazy eye. And they said that and they've done a study that shows that if you live in if a person with a lazy eye can live in utter darkness for 10 days. First off, imagine that. Imagine living in a place where literally it was just pure pitch black darkness. All right. So it's a controlled room. If they live in 10 days of isolation and in pure, deep, utter darkness, the brain actually gets triggered. And what the brain does, it begins to fix the connections in the eyes and actually shown that living in the dark for that long can actually correct a lazy eye. So it's weird how darkness can actually hit a reset, uh, reset button in the brain to help bring greater sight. And that's amazing right there because sometimes God will allow us and he sees us going that way. And when we fall into a pit of isolation or when we are left in the dark, that's when God steps in and says, all right, I'm going to use the dark 
to hit a reset button in your life, to hit a reset button in the way you think, a reset button in the way you feel. And if I can hit a reset button when God does that and a reset button gets hit when we're in the dark, you know what happens? He does it so we can have sight. So we he, we can regain a level of sight, seeing him differently, seeing life differently, seeing ourselves differently. God can use the dark to reset us, to reconnect us back to him. That's awesome. And actually, I want to share one story today. It was a story that it was a story that Jesus shared. And it was a story about that, about how God can use a negative, you know, consequences, whatever it is. How can he take a, a difficult circumstance and use it to hit a reset button? And we're going to talk about that because I believe that's what God's doing right now. I believe that God has caused. OK, I'm sorry. Let me say that again. God, I don't believe God caused all of this to happen, but I believe that he has a purpose behind it all. He didn't cause it to happen, but I believe that God is now taking all of this because he wants to hit a reset button in the church. I believe he's hit. I believe God has hit a reset button in the church, taking everything away, leaving us as pastors to kind of like, you know, walk in the dark. And how are we doing this? What are we going? This is uncharted territory for so many. I believe that he's hitting a reset button in the church to reconnect us back to the purpose of what it means to be a church. What does it mean to be a Christian? I believe that God's hitting reset buttons right now in people's lives. I'm seeing it. I believe it. And if it hasn't yet, guess what? It's going to happen today. All right. I believe it's going to happen today. So let's look at that story. This is one of Jesus' most famous stories. All right, now it's a made-up story he just told to kind of tell a lesson. And it's a story that many theologians and I would agree, uh, I think it has a horrible title. I don't think, I think the title actually distracts us from the whole purpose of the story that Jesus was trying to tell. Now, Jesus didn't give the title. The title was added years, hundreds of years later uh, after, was it Luke? Yep, Luke wrote it hundreds of years later uh, when they imposed chapter and verse and they put titles on there. So Luke didn't add this. Jesus didn't add this. But we're going to talk about the story of the prodigal son. And, I, and again, you'll see by the end why I think that's that's a misleading title because the story is more than just about the son. And so in this story, the purpose that Jesus shares his story is because he's talking to a large group of people like me right now. You know, at this point, Jesus is talking to sinners, right? People, the outcasts in society. He's talking in this crowd that he's talking to. He shares a story with. There's religious figures, religious leaders, scholars who have the Old Testament Bible, the Hebrew Bible memorized. I mean, they know everything like they're, they're the best followers out there there's a bunch of Jesus's believers and disciples there and there's a bunch of people who are just curious I'm like yo I keep on hearing that Jesus is doing some stuff I'm, I just want to know what's up and so Jesus has a very mixed crowd and he's hanging out with some of the outcasts in society and some of the religious folk come up to Jesus and say Jesus Jesus don't waste your time with those people see don't waste your time with those people they listen we don't care about them because you know they don't care about God they don't care about the ways of the Lord. They don't care about God's ways. And so if they don't care about God's ways, then we don't care about them. It's all right. It's what it is. Don't waste your time with them, folk. Don't waste your time with those people. I'm pretty sure you've had some people say that or you've you know, thought about that. Don't waste your time with those people. They're a lost cause. Well, then Jesus says, all right, they're a lost cause. Well, you're kind of right. He then tells a story with everybody about a lost sheep who a shepherd had all this sheep, lost one, went to go looking for one. And now that was obviously back in the day, and they understood that, right? Hey, if, if, if there was a shepherd, and if he lost the sheep, wouldn't he not, he not go looking for it, right? That's his income, right? It matters. Yeah, yeah, they would do that. Then he says a story about a woman. Look, a woman had 10 gold coins or silver coins, whatever the coin was. He had, she had 10 coins of high value. She lost one of them. Don't you think that that lady would go looking for that coin? Everyone, everybody is now nodding their head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like us, like saying, hey, if you went out and you got that new iPhone 11 and you lost it, would you not go looking for that iPhone? Of course you would. Everyone's like, yeah, I would do that, right? If you lost your keys to your car, would you not go looking for it? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. So everyone's understanding. Everyone's tracking. It's like, all right, all right. So if a shepherd would go look for a lost sheep and if a woman would look for a lost coin, would a father go look for a lost son? Everyone's like, okay. And that's what Jesus tells the story. And the whole point of this story is for, to communicate the heart of God, that God loves lost people. In fact, this is a good one right here. All right? You got to listen to this for some of you. You may be lost. You may be left in the dark, but God hasn't lost where you are. All right. God loves people. And if you feel lost, you have not lost your value or your purpose. All right. 
God loves you. And that's what the story is about. So check this out. I'm going to read Luke 15. I'm going to read the whole story. And then we're going to focus on a couple of the key figures in there. All right. So here's the story that Jesus says after he says about the lost sheep, lost coin. He also says, verse 11, a man had two sons. There you go. So I want you guys to know there is a father with two sons. That's what the story is about. The younger of them said to the father, father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent, uh, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, key word, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? Here I am dying of hunger, but I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, so make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him now, he, he goes into that practice speech he had. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called his son. But the father interrupts him and he says, but the father then told and starts talking to the servant, says, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring that fatted calf and let's slaughter it. And let's celebrate with the feast because my son, the son of mine who was dead is now alive again. And he was lost, but now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Now the older son, remember those two sons. Now the older son was in the field and he came near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he said, and your father has slaughtered the fat and calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who, dev who devoured your assets with prostitutes. You slaughtered this fattened calf for him. Okay, notice, your brother of yours. So he's trying to, sh he's even showing all disconnect there instead of saying my brother. The son of yours, I'm sorry. So then the father says, son, he says to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost but now he's found. So you can see this story is really about a man with two sons, not just that one, the prodigal son or the one who you know, took off and came back. And so we're going to look at these three things, all right? There's three people in the story. Let's break it down. The first one, all right, was the lost son. That was the, the first one, right? The prodigal son, the lost son. This guy was one who did everything wrong. I don't know if you caught at the very beginning. He says, listen, uh, I want my inheritance, dad. And obviously, you know, how does inheritance laws work? You don't get your inheritance unless that person dies. Then it's released to you. He's pretty much telling them, I can't wait for you to die. In fact, I don't even want to wait for you to die. I want my money now. I don't want to wait to live my life and wait for you just to finish yours. I want to go. Give me my money. You might as well be dead to be anyways. I want my money. I'm gone. All right. I know a few of you mamas out there who... There is not, I know there's a few of you mamas out there that if any one of your kids would have said those things by the time they closed their mouth and put a period at the end of their sentence, they would have woke up two weeks later from a coma, all right? You know it, you would have put them there, right? Because that's a, that's a level of disrespect that's ridiculous. And so, and so obviously we see this lonely, this, this lost son, I mean, he did everything wrong. The way he mistreated his father, then he just blew all of that money, all that hard-earned money that he had. He wasted it all, right? This guy did everything wrong, all right? Everything wrong. And look where he ended up. 
I mean, it was, you know, even the whole thing with the pigs thing was unique because, see, being Jesus was talking to a Jewish audience. And in this story, they were assuming this person was a Jew. And remember, he was in a far country, different country. Now he's a pig farmer. And pigs were unclean back then. Praise Jesus that the restrictions have been lifted and pork is allowed. I love it. All right. I'm feeling it. All right. Hispanics, how can we be, especially me, uh, my, our Christmases and everything would be not the same without pork. But anyways, so here we see, right? Here we see that he's fallen so low, so low that he's had to do something that is shameful in their case, which would be to raise and feed pigs, right? And here's the thing. See, this son lived by the lifestyle. He lived by the limbo lifestyle, all right? I'm pretty sure as a kid or as adults, you've ever done the limbo, right? You ever heard the chant, how low can you go, all right? How low can you go? How low can you go? That is the limbo lifestyle. And a lot of people like to live the limbo lifestyle, right? Which is how much recklessness can I get away with without wrecking my life, right? That's some people. It's like, how much reckless living can I go and can I get away with without wrecking my life? And, and then, hey, there's Christians who do that too. The Christians who live by the limbo lifestyle say, well, how much sin can I get away with without losing my connection to God? How much sin can I get away with and still be saved? All right. Look, Christians say the only one, everybody. Like, we love to live this limbo lifestyle. How much can we get away with it? Here's the thing. When you try to live by how low can you go, you end up alone, lonely, or lost like he was. How many of us, me included, that we tried to live that fun lifestyle? How much reckless living can I go? And we wrecked a relationship. We wrecked our bodies. We wrecked purpose, hope, money, time, that happens. And those of us, how much sin can I get away with without losing my salvation? And then you realize, all right, it's a little, you went too far. It's hard to tell. We always know we go too far when we go too far. But here's the thing. This son broke all the rules and was far from God, ended up far from his father. He broke all the rules, ended up alone, all right? But he's not the only son. Right? We have the lost son, but did you catch the other one? The lonely son. Did you catch the lonely son? This son didn't go anywhere. I mean, obviously, he sounded like a pretty, you know, pretty decent dude. The oldest brother, right, hung in there and uh, obviously was upset when he found out everything that his brother had done. And then they're coming back and dad's throwing a party for this guy? Like, what? And so he's a super upset. And I think some of you would be rightfully so. I think you would be bothered as well if that happened to you. Right. And here he is. And what did he tell his dad? He says, I slaved myself. I slaved for you. I never disobeyed you once. I'm pretty sure he's exaggerating, but you know how we do. I was perfect. You didn't even give me a goat for a party. See, this son didn't live by the limbo lifestyle. He didn't live by the how low can I go lifestyle. This son lived by the how high can I fly? Now, there's people who do this. All right. There's people who live this way. They say, I got hopes and I got dreams and, and, and they try to do it all. And when they achieve that hope and dream, they get disappointed only to realize that it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And then this is the people who, how high can I fly? There's a lot of people who live for the approval of others. And they work hard and they do everything and they they just want recognition. They just want to be loved. They just want someone to affirm them and to give them value, right? We've done that. I guarantee you. And then guess what? What happens? That's, That's not fun. That doesn't fill your life being affirmed by people. It doesn't fill your life. But listen, Christians do the same thing with God. A Christian that lives by the how high can I fly lifestyle is only focused on how can I get a closer relationship with God? So they, they're like, you know what? I'm, the only book I read is the Bible. The only music I listen to is worship music. You know, the only place I go to is church. Uh, you know, I, I don't do nothing. And I mean, they, they do everything that, that they all, they consume. The only podcast and listen to are preachers. And, and these are the kind, the, these people. Now, well, I, I know you're probably listening to me. I'm like, wait, that sounds, that's bad. I, I, I know. I, I, there is a way to do all of those things. And miss the point. Because of a believer, a Christian, who only lives by the how high can I fly, fills their life with religious activities and never develops a relationship with God. See, this son was busy all the time, but apparently didn't have a relationship with his father. Right? And, and notice that he was missing that affirmation. Dad, you didn't do this for me. And what did the dad say? It's like, you've had everything. 
See, that's the point. That's the problem when we live with how high can I fly mentality, that it's never enough. People's affirmation, the gifts that they give us are never enough. We're always A, B comparing ourselves. We're always saying, well, how come he has, how come he has that when he didn't do anything to deserve that in me? I'm over here busting my butt and how come he gets, or why, you know, why can't I? And, and he's, that's what happens when we live that, how high can I fly? Because you compare yourselves to one another. You either are upset when somebody else has something that you don't have, or they are on another level that you're not, or it's the opposite. When you go, how high can I fly? You either feel insecure because someone's, high fly, someone's flying higher, or you think you're better than everybody else who's beneath you. That's what happens when you live that lifestyle. That's what happens when you live with that focus. It's not enough. See, this son was still lonely, and he lived in the house. He lived in the house, and look, he was left outside all by himself. Didn't want to be in the party. See, here's the thing about his story that we get to see is that even if you follow all the rules, you can miss the point. Even if you follow all the rules, you can miss the point. You can still end up far. You can still end up isolated. You break all the rules, definitely you're going to fall into some isolation there. You follow all the rules, you can still end up there. So then where's the point? Then, all right, well, where's, where's the solution here? Well, that's why it's a story not just about two brothers. It's a story about a father and two sons. See, the father now, see, he was different. The father did everything that was necessary to reach both sons. Did you notice? In fact, he had done everything prior to, right? The, the son, when he realized, right, he realized when he was at his lowest of lows, he realized a reset button was hit in his brain. And he realized, what am I doing? What am I doing here? What have I done? It's like, my father wouldn't mistreat anybody like this. My father wouldn't do this. What have, what have I done here? See, a reset button hit in his brain. And so now he started coming back to, coming back to dad. But, but I love this. This father did everything necessary. I don't know if you caught in a minute in the story, it said that the son, while he was a far way off, meaning the father wasn't on the porch with his arms, he was like, oh, okay, uh, look who's back, <laughs> look who's back. See, he wasn't with his arms crossed on the porch. In fact, some scholars and some even some theologians, even as we look at this verse, said that the father wasn't probably even home. The father had been looking far off for the son. The father wasn't waiting for the son to come back. The father went looking for the son. And as the son was walking to the father, what did the father do? He had compassion and the father ran. He walked, but the father ran. And he knew, he knew, he didn't need the speech. He knew his son had changed and he was just glad that he was back. See, this father did everything possible to restore the lost son. But notice the father doing everything possible to reconnect the lonely son, to affirm him, to say, listen, no, you've had it all. You ha you've had more than you realize. I love you, but you have to recognize that we have to, you know, this is your brother too, and we should be happy for him as well. This father did everything possible. He never stopped loving. He never stopped looking. He never did. And he paid the price for it all. I think of uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, right? Or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, whichever version you like, whichever title you like best, okay? Uh, what was Charlie doing? Charlie had to pay the price to try to find that golden ticket, right? And he was looking for that ticket. Where can I go? What can I do? How can I find? And he was willing to pay whatever price it was to get that candy, to be able to find the golden ticket and to get to go to his favorite place ever, right? Willy Wonka and, the, you know, and that chocolate factory. But, and, and I don't know, I haven't seen, I, I remember seeing both movies. I think they're both blurring in right now. I never read the book. But he finally found that ticket because the father, right? Or the grandfather in this case, right? The father or the grandfather, one of the two. He bought and paid for the candy. And in that candy was that golden ticket. And so, see, in the same way, Charlie was looking for that golden ticket because it meant something. It mattered to him. And he was willing to pay whatever price it was to find it. Listen, that was the father. The father was willing to pay whatever price it was. Listen, he paid the price of time. The father ended up, uh, he lost that estate. Everything that he had given the one son, he had to eat that. It was over. Like, there's no paying that back. He paid the price to redeem his son. He paid the price of having to take the time and the effort to go reach out to find his sons. He paid the price to, you know, sacrifice a fattened calf. The father paid the price for forgiveness so that the family can be reconnected back together again. 
That's the story, really. The hero of the story is the father. He is the focus of this story. And the reason why we see these three people is because, listen, you and I can easily fall ourselves, find in, in ourselves in between one of the two sons. And the two brothers, though very different, had the same thing in common. They were both self-centered. Those sons were self-centered. They wanted to do things for themselves, right? Whether it was, you know, wild living or religious living, they did it for themselves and they were the only focus. And in the end, they found themselves lost. Now, the one son turned around and hit the reset button. The lonely son, we don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us. He kind of leaves people in the dark whether that son chose to come into the party or not and leaves us with that choice. Who are we going to be? Because let's, and, and I want to encourage you with this, okay? Careless living and careful obedience, they can't save us from ourselves. You catch me? Careful obedience. I'm sorry, careless living and careful obedience won't save us from ourselves, okay? It's only the compassionate love of Jesus that leads us out of isolation and into restoration. It is his love for us. Look, right now, we've been experiencing with this whole COVID-19 thing, right? Everything's been shut down, right? Churches has been shut down, restaurants, movie theaters, sports, arenas, everything has been shut down. You know something that hasn't shut down this entire time? You know something that hasn't been closed? God's heart for you. God's heart has not been closed this entire time. It's been open. It's been open. He has been there this whole time. What if we're the ones who close our hearts to him? What if we, what if something happened over these last four, you know, maybe you lost your job or your, your, your income has been furloughed or you had now added stress and with your relationships or just things are, you're not doing okay. What if something has happened that has caused you to close your heart to God. God's heart hasn't been closed. It's still open. Has never, and, then, and, never, and it never will close. All right? So what if for some of us, we need to open our hearts for the first time? What if some of you need to reopen your hearts? And for every believer, what if God is, wants us as well to widen our hearts even more so he can do what only he can do? See, that's that reset. But this is the reset button that we're talking about. The one son came to his senses. He was in the dark, in his deep pit, and he came to his senses. A reset button was hitting his heart, and he realized, I didn't just sin against you know, my father. I sinned against God, heaven, and you, realizing what I did was huge. That God, you know, he hit a reset button, and that reset button led to his reconnection. And the other father was trying, the father was trying to encourage the other son, trying to hit that same reset button with compassionate, kind love. Listen. That's what God wants to do in our lives. He doesn't want to just hit the reset button one time. Look, I, I've needed that, re that button reset plenty of times. Okay, It just happens. We need to. But it's in those moments that God will, we, he finds us there and we maybe lead ourselves there. But then he want, you know, allows that and takes that so that he can hit that reset button in the dark to give us a greater sight, to give us a greater sight of who he is, who we are in him, a greater vision for the world. All right, I'm 2020, right? 2020 vision. Uh, who would have thought at the who would have thought at the beginning of 2020, right? We're talking about 2020 vision. Who would have thought that God was going to, in order to hit a reset button, He was going to need to put us in the dark or or uh, take this moment to leverage to hit that reset button in your life? And I'm asking, are you willing to let God hit that reset button? All right, because listen, wild living, wild living is not. You've been there. I know some of y'all done this. You've been there, tried that. Wild living ain't going to cut it. Religious living is definitely not going to cut it. All right? It's only a relationship with God. And Jesus did everything possible to be able to hit that reset button. And all it is, and what does this relationship with God look like? Well, let me tell you what it is. The Jesus even said it. Just follow me. Following Jesus. That's what it's supposed to be. Following Jesus. Like, that's what a Christian's supposed to be. By the way, I don't know if you know that the term Christian didn't come out to years, 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 years after Jesus rose from the dead. You know, the, the diff, Christians had different names. In fact, the word Christian was actually a negative term that I'm not, you know, any racial term that you can think of right now. Okay, think of that. Any derogatory, you know, derogative term that we use for someone. That's what the word Christian was. It was a slam. 
But then eventually people took, oh, okay, no, I identify with my Jesus, so I'm not going to take that as a slam. I'm going to own up to that. I'm a Christian now. But what Jesus calls us to be is followers. That's what a Christian is. And we all admit to this, right? There is no such thing as a perfect person, and Christians will admit there is no such thing as a perfect Christian. Yet why do Christians beat themselves up when they feel like they are not where they are not where they feel they should be, that their prayers should be on a different level, that they should be at a different level, and then they feel like, well, I'm not a good enough Christian. There's no such thing as a good enough Christian. There's not. A Christian is someone who follows Jesus. Meaning, you took 10 steps back. Okay, how are you following Jesus today? Are you taking one step forward? Maybe you fell down. Maybe you were on the ground. Well, following Jesus means just getting back up again. That's what it means. When you follow Jesus, there's space for growth. There is grace for growth. There's grace for if you goofed up and realized, what have I done? It's okay. You can hit that. God wants to hit that reset button to reconnect you back again. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And when we follow Jesus, part of following Jesus is this. It's realizing that you don't find God, all right? I want you to check this out. You didn't find God. God found you. And when God finds you, he just invites you to follow. And when, let me tell you something about found people, okay? Find people, follow people. I'm sorry, find people, find people. That's what they do. Found people, find people. All right, if you've been found by God, then you're going to want to go and love and reach out to the same way the father went off to where people were. He, you are going to do that. God's going to lead you to help others to find Jesus too. That's what we do. That's what the church is. Like We need to hit a reset button because being a Christian is not just showing up to church. Being a Christian is showing up in people's lives. That's what it means. That's what it means. Because why? Because our God showed up and when he showed up, Man, he shows off and he shows how amazing and how great he is despite anything else. God's love and his heart for you has never shut down this whole time. And all he's asking is to follow. Listen, right now at the end of this COVID-19 thing, right, we're seeing a lot of things opening up and things are beginning to change again, right? Look, a lot has changed. We don't even know what the new normal is going to look like. What are things that we will never do the same way like we did before? You know, and that, that happens. That's life. That's normal. A lot has changed. And newsflash, things will continue to change. But do you know that there's certain things that never change no matter what? There's certain things that never change. People still need are still looking for meaning and purpose. Some things never change. There's still people who think that wild living is going to fix their life. People think There's some people who think that religious living is what's the way to go. Some things never change. But you know what's amazing? The, the biggest and the best part that never changes is God's love, who he is. The world can change. You can change. God never changes. Our opinions change, but God's opinion of you has never changed. I love that. All he wants us to do is to follow. We don't know what the future looks like, but Jesus says, but I know where I'm going. I know how to get there. Are you willing to follow me? And I'll lead you the rest of the way. Now, let me tell you what following Jesus doesn't look like. Following Jesus is not about looking into the past, all right, and focusing on all the bad things that you ever did, all right? And that's not what following Jesus is. You can't look back at all that wild living that you used to do and feel that that disqualifies you, okay? Following Jesus is not focusing on all the bad that you've ever done. And following Jesus isn't about looking here in the moment and figuring out all the good that you have to do in order to be good and be right with God. No, okay? Following Jesus is focusing on one thing, Jesus, how much he loves you. Focusing on what he has done. Not focusing on what you've done. Focusing on what he's done. Following Jesus is not focusing on what do I need to do right now. It's focusing on what he is doing and what he wants to do right now. It is so much freeing. Listen, I believe God wants to hit a reset button in the church, in the world. But he needs to do that personally in you. And when you allow God to reset you, he sets you he resets you. He sets you free. Free to follow. So I want to pray for you right now as we're kind of wrapping up because there's some of you right now that need to hit that reset. 
that you've been at the end of this quarantine session and things are not looking well, they're not ending well, all right, maybe you're not doing too well, or you're nervous, maybe something new has happened in here, right? Or you're you know, nervous about the future or whatever else it'll be. Listen, I wanna be able to pray with all of you right now. All right, so I wanna lead you in a prayer. So let's all bow our heads wherever you're at and let's pray. God, I thank you, God, because you are the father in that story. God, I thank you that you don't lose, you don't fall out of love with your people, with people, God, if we fall into sin. God, you never lose sight of us even when we're lost. And we never lose, God, our value and our worth even when we're lost. We thank you, God, that you are this amazing, good father who's out there searching and out there after us, God. I thank you that despite our feelings, that if we feel that you are far, God, it doesn't mean that you are, that the feeling is there, but you are. It doesn't mean that you're not, because you always are. And even, Lord, when we feel that you're not fair, when we feel like you're not fair, God, it doesn't mean you aren't. There you are. You are good. You are close, and you are good. God, I pray that you may hit that reset button right now in our lives for everybody who feels far right now. God, I pray that you may hit that reset button. Help them to see, Jesus, that you are near, that you are there, that you have never left them, and that all that they have, God, all that they need is in you. And for anyone, God, who feels, maybe this isn't fair. Why why did I lose my job and they didn't? Why are my kids struggling and someone else is thriving? God, I pray that they may see, God, that you are beyond good. You are beyond good and that you can turn all things around and there's nothing too difficult for you to do. That you can take our wrongs and make them right. You can take our bad and use it for our good because you're that good. And if that's any of you right now, I want you to ask. If you're feeling those things, I want you to just ask God right now and say, Lord, reset. Reset my mind right now. Reset my heart. God, I pray that those who are praying right now for a reset. God, I even pray for those Christians right now who are watching. Every believer who's watching, watching right now, God, I pray that you may put in their heart just like mine. God, even reset what it means to be a Christian. Reset it mean what it means to follow you. Like reset your purposes for my life right now. For all of those who have lost their mission and lost their purpose, lost what their meaning is in life. God, I pray right now that they may ask you to do it, that you may reset their hearts and minds right now and that they may put their eyes on you. And that you may embrace them right now with your love. That you may just embrace them, God, with your strength and peace right now. And God, we thank you, Jesus, that you, you paid the price for this with your son. Jesus, you laid your life down as a sacrifice to pay for this reconnection. The fact that we can be reset. So Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for all that you've done. And thank you because since you conquered sin and death, that means there is nothing that we cannot overcome through you, in you. And as we wrap up, if you right now, if you're feeling like if there's something that is drawing you right now, you're still watching me and you're not sure why, that's because you're feeling that the Father's love right now drawing you near. And he's meeting you right now. And he wants to set the ultimate reset button in your life. That when he hits that reset button and you believe in Jesus and you receive the forgiveness of your sins, he not just resets you. It's not just a mental thing. It's a pure thing. And that you now were an enemy of God. Now you are son and daughter of God. He trans, this is the beginning of your transformation right now. It's amazing. And all you have to do is believe and say, Jesus, And so if you don't know how to pray that, I'm going to pray with you right now. You can pray whatever is on your heart. And for everyone else, let's join in, pray together. Let's intercede for all those people right now who are going to ask Jesus to hit the ultimate reset button in their life. So just if that's you, you want to pray that prayer, then just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe that you still live today. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can learn how to find life and learn to follow you throughout my life. Thank you, Jesus. I give you my life. It is not my own. I ask and receive life in Jesus right now in faith. 
And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.